was a gray day. Far off, storms lurked and prowled, looking for a place to settle, and an unexpected spotlight of sun beamed, shining on all the land that was free, and leaving Germany in darkness and shadow. I peered into the town through the strong field glasses I had liberated from a German officer near Beaugency. There wasn't anything to see but the broken bridge, the empty houses, and a string of laundry, forlorn and forgotten. The Siegfried line was just landscape to the unaided eye. Through the glasses, I could see luscious flat lawns like putting greens. They were the fire areas between the black mushrooms, which were gun emplacements. A tape trap accompanied by a gun was at a crossroads, and on the horizon was a village which they said was housing two divisions of retreated Huns. I watched a crowd duck out of a tunnel entrance and make for another. I'd hoped we'd shoot him, but he only had 20 yards to go, and it'd take three minutes to get the artillery on him. We could have slugged him with a machine gun, but that would have given away a new position we were saving for tomorrow. By dawn, the tracks to the forward observation post were sunk deep in the earth. We pushed waves of mud, the color of Cive de Lievre, ahead of us and stuck. So we walked on thick fallen leaves through the forest to the fringe of the trees. The BC scope didn't help much in the mist, so I knew my cameras wouldn't be able to see any better than I. Disappointing. There were sentries scattered invisibly through the woods, still as Indians in khaki against the tree trunks, and fox holes had been dug here and there. A little mole with a pink nose had the same idea and was poking at the leaves to start a burrow. He had a scar on his back. I guess he didn't want to get wounded again. Colonel Crable showed me maps of how the action was to be carried out on several towns at a time, up and down the frontier. Some of them were on our side of the frontier and some on theirs. Our side had been evacuated except for soldiers. We hadn't found out about theirs yet. There were no birds. Leaves cushioned our footsteps. And silence swelled over the mist hung valley to envelop us. We spoke in whispers, although the enemy was at least a mile away. I didn't hear the first guns firing. I only heard and saw the rounds land. Then the whole valley echoed with the boom, bark, tattoo, and cough of different styles and sizes of weapons. The shells churned and added to the haze over the town. Smoke from the phosphorus wiggled out of the fog, and a machine gun in the woods to the left of us traced pink lines toward the houses. I kept thinking, tear on the dotted line, sign upon the dotted line, tear on the dotted line. There was no near counter battery, in fact very little anywhere, although a mortar bomb crashed with a puff of smoke near the machine gun and a shell felled a tiny tree across the road for, through the forest. Such a silly little casualty for a whopping big gun. Two. What were the off-duties going to do? I asked questions while sitting four in a row in the latrine. The paper was staked on crossbars, there was grass underfoot, an odor of disinfectant and a lack of shyness. One was going to sleep all day until night duty in a pink satin nighty and woolen socks. Another would wash all those things and herself. A third would go and find a boy in Ward 2. He was from her hometown and knew someone she knew. The others were on duty. I ambled out vaguely and was shown that hot water came from galvanized iron cans into which the bowels of a bazooka heater had been stuck. That I should have brought my own basin. That there was a juggling trick to holding the press button of a Lister bag a toothbrush, and the paste all at once. That there are three positions for squatting, two of which are semi-perched on a helmet, 
The other, you're using the helmet to wash in, so lean on your left heel. Three. There was a girl in the hallway talking French a mile a minute and crying. An artillery officer had her in tow and her face was scratched. She told me three stories in ten minutes. That she was lost from her friends in the refugee line the night before. That she wanted a job helping us. And that the French were against her and she wanted protection. I suspected the last to be very close to the truth. And when some French security officers came along, asked them what they thought. They thought she was a very bad girl, had consorted with all sorts of Germans, and was altogether an undesirable and dangerous character. Would I please keep her under lock and key until the civilian police could catch up with her? Otherwise, she'd have her throat cut by the population. She caught sight of our French resistance guard and threw herself on me, weeping and kissing my hands and clasping me around the legs. I couldn't slap her as I would have done to another hysteric, as possibly the French would take it as an encouragement for more haircutting episodes and vengeance treatments. I had to put my arm around her and take her up to my pal Frank Nasberg's room and tell him in a gentle, hypocritical voice in English that he must keep her there and act as if he were protecting her. I felt horribly Judas saying the things I had found out about her in a voice that sounded to her as if it were in defense. Four. On the other hand, it was very exciting to arrive back toward the south where liberation had just been put into effect. To be waved at, flowers, tomatoes, peaches thrown into the car with little sense for the perishable qualities of the material and less for our eyes and skulls. To get into towns abandoned by the Germans days before, but that no one had had the time to occupy, is a time-taking procedure. Someone has to receive the champagne, the speech, the keys of the city. Sometimes it was me for no reason except that it is a ceremony and no other business of the municipality can function until that duty is done. Five. Paris had gone mad. The long, graceful, dignified avenues were crowded with flags and filled with screaming, cheering, pretty people. Girls, bicycles, kisses and wine, and around the corner sniping a bursting grenade, and a burning tank. The bullet holes in the windows were like jewels, the barbed wire in the boulevards a new decoration, and the wrecked German war machines were play boxes for urchins who had watched these same tanks in action the night before. The Parisians had made a fantastic game of their week of war. The stakes were life and death, as they had been for four grim years. But in their long-awaited battle, they acted with gaiety, irresponsibility, and flowers in their hair. Boys who had grown up under the occupation gained rifles and manhood in one gesture. They fought at barricades, swarmed over rooftops, and sniped snipers. Girls in flippant clothes carried ammunition, food, and messages. Families destroyed the much-hated Hunt posters and raided collaborationist strongholds. The much-ridiculed French telephone system continued to function for the French. Jean-Pierre could telephone Philippe to drop his grenades into a courtyard nest of Krauts. Marie, who could see the door of Monsieur Le Grosse's shop, could warn him that the enemy was aiming at it. Marcel could look out of her window and phone that the FFI, typically nicknamed the Fifis, behind the statue were being outflanked and could reinforcements be sent. The whole army could use the system from Banlu to center, warning of ambushes, routes for supply, and tactics. In fact, the telephone was the miracle of the battle. The flips, cops to you will never be despised again as they went into civilian clothes the day of the insurrection with the general strike, hid all the secret dossiers from the Germans, 
and confuse the enemy's scheme of retreat as only a professional law enforcer could imagine. Our boys were kissed and cheered and showered with presents. They battled in one square and celebrated in the next. They manned guns on a corner with a small boy and a dictionary. Every jeep had a jill, every soldier an armful of mademoiselles. And the crowds managed to wave more and more, never letting a tank or car go by without another cheer. I arrived exhausted by my share of millions of handshakes, the embraces of grandmothers, of French sharpshooters, and bevies of French girls. I was the femme soldat. Small used to say I was just a journalist and I'd rather keep my hands busy on my camera shutter much as I loved them. Anyway, I was in Paris. I'd seen Versailles with my own eyes, untouched, the little orange trees peppering the terrace. I'd seen the beloved Eiffel Tower spiking up into the blue sky over a golden sunbathed Paris. The Sacre Coeur shimmered on the horizon and the Place de la Concorde hid its wounds, barbed wire and scorched cars behind the skirts of the cheering crowds. Six, some tanker destroyer men said they'd been talking and thought it was very good to have me around, as then they minded their four-letter language. Thinking of some of the refinements of my own vocabulary, I was deeply touched by their concern, which was reciprocal. I reformed for their sake. We discussed how long it would take to sound good again when they got home. We decided 24 hours like tongue-tied morons and three days of rigid probation. Then everything would be all right unless angry. But beware, 20 years from now the war virus can crop out. Seven. Who was the first dead person you ever saw? A grandmother or someone decently arranged and awesomely sleep-like, surrounded by wreaths as you walked past with slow, shy steps to music? We've all been conditioned wrong. Why should I have been put to bed for 10 hours sleep at an hour when I'd only be a nuisance the other end, wanting breakfast at impossible hours for grown-ups? We should have been exposed to nightclubs and sleep snatching and alarms and excursions to prepare us for this, our life. Why meals at regular hours with calories and vitamins and bulk considered? We should have been made to scrounge like street Arabs, survive on a crust and beg our way. Eight. I'm extremely irritable quite often, and especially when I don't understand people. I'm also inclined to scream at them when they try to tell me that the bombed out half bra house won't make me an interesting picture because it is all destroyed, and that there is no use photographing the local monuments because they are, all, are ruined. The first ten times I explain that I'm busy making documents and not art, and the eleventh I start screaming, for Christ's sake, shut up and mind your own business. <laughs> All you're supposed to do is tell me what goes on in these various addresses. Through a great deal more thick than thin, which was acid enough, we turned the city. And then this last piece, number eight. And this is a letter um, from Lee to her editor, Audrey. Dear Audrey, things move very fast, as you may be noticing. And Lee here is either moving when she wants to stay put or planted when she has itchy feet. I no sooner sit down to catch some digestion and eliminate some facts than the war has moved so far the Army HQ is in the next building, complete with brass buttons and police who wonder why your shoes aren't polished or your pants pressed. Since I'm wearing the same trousers I wore when I left Paris six weeks ago, and my other shirt is lost, the only thing to do is keep moving forward. However, I never finish a story at that rate, as you may have noticed too. One film in the envelope is soaked in melted lip rouge, 
Be careful in handling as the grease space will make fingerprints. Love, Lee. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And Celine Miller. Oh, cheers to all of you guys. Give yourselves a round of applause.